I have with me today Ambassador of Afghanistan to India, Mr. Farid Mamunzeh. He is uh, the ambassador of Afghanistan to India under the previous government, the Islamic uh, Republic of Afghanistan. So we'll discuss with him the situation in Afghanistan and what's the way forward. Welcome to the print ambassador and thank you for talking to us. Thanks, so uh, we are talking uh, in an environment where there is so much of uncertainty that we see emanating from Afghanistan. It's been 10 months since uh, Kabul fell and we've seen an interim government there um, under the Islamic Emirate, the Taliban ruling uh, Afghanistan. We see all sorts of uh, reports of violence, bombing in mosques, gurdwaras, uh, women rights being taken away, even primary schools, women secondary schools are not operating. Uh, in this kind of a scenario, what do you think is the internal situation? Where is it all going? I believe the constitution is also has been cancelled, null and void. Uh, what is happening there? Well, the country is, uh, as you rightly put out, you know, we are going through multiple crises at the same time. Uh, we are faced by many crises, but primarily the country is faced by, by, four, by four major crises. We are going through political crisis in the form of uh, a non-existence of parliament, um, no political plan or clarity in the political landscape of the country. So we have no timeline for any political activism uh, as you would have uh, in any uh, country or as you would have in any democracy. Uh, so the political crises are, are there in, in full fledged. Um, we have no constitution that govern the country. We have a government uh, which was supposedly an interim government, which has almost completed a year. Uh, and the government is exclusively made of Taliban leaders uh, with no inclusion or involvement of any other groups uh, other than Taliban. There is no female uh, participation. There is not even a single woman in, in, in our government. So. There is a full pledge um, political crisis. Secondly, we are faced with economic crisis. The country is going through a difficult time economically. Um, you know, according to recent uh, World Bank reports that almost half a million people have lost jobs since Taliban have taken over the country. Um, there is in, in, in a country where the population is less than 40 million. Half a million jobs are, are a great number. And together with economic crisis, we have financial crisis. You know, banks um, are facing liquidity crisis. Um, there are international sanctions. Um, the third crisis are humanitarian crisis. We are faced with food shortage. We are faced with medicine shortage. Um, we are faced with drought and, and famine. Uh, and the fourth crisis is human rights crisis, uh, where the rightful rights of Afghan women um, and girls have been denied to them. They can't go to work, they can't continue with their education. Uh, so these four are, are the major uh, crises faced by ordinary Afghan. And, uh, and as we call it, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the darkest moments um, in, in a generation in our history. So a very difficult time um, faced by um, the entire country um, and I hope that um, in the months ahead some common sense will prevail in order to put an end to it. Mm -hmm. Well, um, when we talk about what the West is doing in terms of the fact that uh, the Taliban has not kept uh, some of the major commitments that it made, as you rightly said about inclusivity in the government, giving women rights. There is uh, violence going on against the minorities and also uh, against other ethnicities. Uh, we see Taliban leaders traveling around the world, seeking legitimacy, going to several countries. Yes, there has been a travel ban, but that's also yeah. on a few ministers, not uh, on all of them. So. And then there are uh, assets that have been frozen of common Afghan people in the U.S., which the U.S. is saying they'll not release unless there is uh, Taliban meets all those commitments. Do you think the West is doing enough? What, what would you like to say on that? 
Well, I think sanctions in general uh, are hurting the Afghan people. There should be a distinction between targeting or punishing the ruling class versus the general population. The sanctions are hurting our people. Be the sanctions on, on um, financial um, assets in the form of foreign reserves, um, or um, sanctions on, on the banking sector, although there has been some uh, um, flexibilities given by the Treasury Department, the US Treasury Department last year. But generally, the sanctions are not hurting Taliban. Um, the West um, has been dealing with Taliban on, on their own terms. Uh, there hasn't been a very collective approach from the West to deal with Taliban as, as a single entity, as a single bloc. Um, so Taliban have been um, making good use of, uh, of that approach. We have 13 people, we had 15 people in the sanction list. Out of the 100,000 plus Taliban, we had only 15 people in the sanction list. And there were countries in the UN Security Council who have been opposing those sanctions. Mm -hmm. Very powerful and important countries. Just two days back, you know, two relatively junior Taliban leaders um, were kept on that sanction list the higher education minister and the deputy education minister. Now, if you look at the, the history of those two individuals, they're not very senior Taliban leaders. Mm -hmm. The remaining 13 have been given a 30 days relief period, uh, a 90 days relief period. And historically, th this relief period was there, this started three years ago for the purpose of peace process, mm -hmm. for the purpose of peace talks. Yes. So there is no peace process, there is no mm -hmm. peace talks. Why is the relief extended every time when that particular duration is, is expired. I think what is required is targeted sanctions. And more than targeted sanctions, I think we need the international community need to engage Taliban in a constructive manner to encourage them, uh, uh, to, to, in order to encourage them to embrace inclusivity, to respect rule of law, to respect human rights, um, ordinary Afghans are tired with conflict. You know, we, we have reached a point where uh, people have no stamina, no energy, and no desire for, for any prolonged or protracted conflict anymore. So is this also the re reason why we are seeing that the resistance is not uh, taking off the resistance movement, as you said, that Afghans are tired of fighting? Yeah. I think the resistance, there is no comparison um, when it comes to Taliban's means and resources versus uh, the resistance movement. The resistance mm -hmm. is by no means comparable with the might that the Taliban have today. The Taliban control the entire country, they control the entire population. There is resistance uh, in, in small pockets of the country uh, and they have been giving some hard time to Taliban from time to time. But the resistance is facing intergroup rivalry yeah, among themselves. There is no regional and international backing of the resistance. There are funding issues also, so I believe. So when there is no regional support, there is no international support, the resistance is not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, like I said, the way forward here is that the international community, the region come together and speak to the Taliban in one voice to embrace inclusivity, political in inclusivity, come up with a plan that President Karzai came up with in 2002, early 2002, a roadmap for political life of the country. This month, 20 years ago, we had our Lueja, the Grand Assembly or the big panchayat in the country that sat there for six, six days. And on the 17th of June, um, it concluded uh, that Jirga concluded and came up with a political roadmap that in the next two years the constitution had to be drawn, presidential election should help take okay. place, parliamentary election should take place. We need a plan that the Taliban need to come up with. You know, we, we had this government for the past 
11 months now almost 11 months um, which was um, supposedly an interim or caretaker government and caretaker government cannot continue on for years you need to have a roadmap for mm -hmm. uh, for the steps for the follow-up steps that that are required sadly that is not the case today uh, Taliban have failed to constitute in, in, in an inclusive government which would represent non-Taliban leaders. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we, we also need to keep the fact in mind that Taliban uh, was a group that had uh, grown uh, in an environment where they were fighting NATO and foreign forces. Um, now they need to overcome that mindset and, and they need to learn how to go and they need to learn how to adapt to uh, new realities uh, of today's Afghanistan and begin to accept political opposition. Political right. opposition requires hold elections, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, not, not opposing other political entities militarily. Mm -hmm. we, we expect them to. Um, to adopt to new realities and, and show flexibility and governance mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. So if I can ask you, Ambassador, what's the kind of uh, future do you see uh, for the Islamic Republic, right? You are still, uh, you know, working as the ambassador despite all the hardships that all embassies, uh, Afghan embassies are facing. Um, we saw your former president, uh, Mr. Ghani, apologizing, your former NSA, uh, Mr. Mohib, apologizing publicly through some channels internationally. Uh, but then uh, are they also planning to uh, go back to Afghanistan, uh, play their political roles? Uh, we, we've heard President Hamid Karzai, also former president, making some statements. Dr. Abdullah Abdullah was in India. Uh, what is going on within that setup as well? Well, we had some strong leaders um, over the past 20 years who managed to um, keep the country together, who managed to contribute immensely, uh, keeping all those high moral grounds there, and um, who chose never to leave Afghanistan. Uh, and these include people like President Karzai, Dr. Abdullah, and the Senate Speaker, and the deputies of Dr. Abdullah, um, and, and several other leaders across uh, ethnic group across the country. Um, and they were the people, they were the first Afghans who engaged Taliban. Um, now it is us the Afghans who would have to come to terms among ourselves. Our problems would have to be addressed by ourselves. Yes, we may require a fair and impartial mediation from countries either in the region or beyond the region. But our differences would have to be settled by ourselves. And those steps were taken by people like President Karzai and Dr. Abdullah to encourage Taliban, to call on them to act responsibly. Not only responsibly, but reasonably. Mm -hmm. uh, and that had an impact. Um, that had forced Taliban to reconsider the way uh, their approach was in the first few months, which was um, a very brutal approach. If you look at um, atrocities committed in Afghanistan till April, uh, and those atrocities well documented by the international press, by human rights organizations, in the time after March, April this year, there has been um, a reconsideration on part of Taliban, and I hope you know, I hope this would continue. I hope that the Taliban uh, would begin to come to terms with the fact that if they are going to rule Afghanistan, they would have to respect the will of the Afghan people. Uh, and what President Karzai and Dr. Abdullah and others are advising them is the will of the Afghan people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's a noble thing that uh, President Rani, uh, Dr. Mohib, apologized to, to the security forces, to, to, to uh, the Afghan people. 
but our failure had two two components. Um, Afghanistan was not uh, failed, or the collapse did not happen overnight. Uh, the start of the collapse started uh, when the U.S. reached a peace deal with Taliban, and when the Taliban realized that if they could take over Kabul forcefully, why negotiate for it? They were given a free hand um, by by the West in general, by the U.S. in particular, and and we were left alone. But the peace talks were still going on after the after the deal was signed between. Uh, when the Taliban realized that, uh, you know, as soon as the withdrawal of the international forces would complete, they can easily take over on on the country. Uh, we relied on the U.S. And other NATO allies for the war machinery, for ammunition, for logistics. And we, in the last days of the conflict, and this is on record, we were having issues with, with logistics, we were having issues with ammunition. So it was not uh, an army that existed for hundreds of years or, or half a century, it was an army that was there for, for almost 15 years. And it was the army was more of a of a counterterrorism force. It was not a very conventional army. They they did their best, but uh, uh, we were left alone. Um, the U.S. did not end the Afghan war. They end their their involvement in this war. The war continued. They 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 left us at a stage where we continue with the war and uh, sadly on our part the war was lost due to poor leadership mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's a noble uh, gesture and act on part of the president to come out and apologize. Uh, the Afghan leadership had to be blamed for it. Uh, we were not only failed by the West but uh, uh, there has been instances where we failed ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I remember uh, in the sense that, you know, when uh, I was there, when the fall of Kabul happened, there were many energetic boys. I met people, you know, from your former uh, Afghan forces who really were willing to sacrifice, but they, they did not have the uh, right kind of equipment and the support. Uh, but then going forward, now if I focus on the region, South Asia, and India's role in it. Uh, we recently had a delegation uh, from the Ministry of External Affairs going and engaging, having some kind of a dialogue uh, with the Taliban leaders there in Kabul with the aim of restarting probably some of our projects, but also to have a people-to-people -people, uh, kind of a connection, reopening the embassy with um, some uh, junior level uh, officers. Do you think, um, and India has also been helping with humanitarian assistance, do you think India is doing enough or you expect India to do something else as well? Um. Well, we, um, we have always um, desired uh, for greater um, involvement of India in Afghanistan. Um, there has been a very close contact uh, between our people. Uh, the Republic doesn't exist today, but their relation with Afghanistan exists. Uh, it is the relation between India and Afghanistan, not between the Republic of India or the Republic of Afghanistan. Uh, those relations have been many centuries or, or several millenniums old. Uh, those relations have been there and it would be there regardless of changes in regimes, changes in governments. Uh, our expectation uh, from India, and as you, you rightly mentioned, that you were there uh, during the time of the collapse, was um, our expectation. Our expectations were high. That uh, is, as a strong and historical friend, India would um, take certain initiatives uh, to help. The Afghan people in their difficult time. 
uh, sadly that did not happen. Uh, Afghans needed a helping hand to leave the country. Um, the US helped a great deal, the Europeans, the, U the UK, France, Germany, Italy and many other U European nations come forward and, and took their share of responsibility. That sadly did not happen in the case of India. The Afghans um, felt left alone. Secondly, um, there has been a very blanket approach uh, and part of New Delhi to uh, either revoke vi visas or not issue new visas to Afghans. And there were historical friends. And I've said this quite a few times that the entire country then become Taliban overnight. They were students. Uh, they were very historic friends of India. There. So they, they were not supported. Uh, they were not given the right assistance uh, at, uh, at a required time. Uh, India's delegation at this stage going into Afghanistan is, is seen uh, as a positive move on part of Delhi. Um, and I personally think that it is good for three reasons. Um, first, for the humanitarian, to ease up the humanitarian crisis. India has the capacity to help ease the world's worst humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. It is the largest humanitarian crisis in the world today. India has contributed 50,000 metric ton of wheat, 13,000 ton of metric ton of medicine, millions of polio vaccines, uh, and, and more is needed. India could certainly do more. Secondly, for India's security um, reasons, the presence is, is needed. Uh, the UN recent report uh, on, on security in Afghanistan indicates that terrorism has increased or terror activities have increased in, in, um, in Afghanistan. Just to give you one example of Jesh Muhammad, the, the number of their camps have increased from 8 to 13. So India can't just turn uh, uh, a blind, blind eye on, on what is happening in Afghanistan. We have all regional countries present in Kabul today. We have China, Pakistan, Iran, Uzbekistan, Russia, Turkmenistan. So India is, is too big uh, to be left to, to be left out of Kabul. We, we require, and the Afghan people, like I said, desire their presence, India's presence in Kabul. And third, to engage Taliban in a constructive way. Is the world's largest democracy, India has a role to play here. And that is to encourage Taliban to come uh, forward and um, accept um, rule of law, ex accept uh, political inclusivity uh, and encourage them to take steps that are appropriate. Instability in Afghanistan costs the entire region. And, and there's a fact to be remembered that we, South Asia, is the least integrated part in the world. We have very limited trade among ourselves. We, we have very limited uh, connectivity. connectivity among ourselves. So what kind of future do you want to envision for ourselves? What, what future do you want for this region? India is the largest South Asian country. Uh, the most responsible SARC member. Um, it has a, a greater responsibility in this region. So uh, as a smaller nation, as a smaller country, or, or geographically the third largest country in, in the SARC, the fourth largest country in the SARC in terms of population, uh, I think India's outreach uh, is morally right. It is politically right. And uh, Taliban have welcomed India's involvement and I think uh, India need to capitalize on that.
mm-hmm. for the greater good of this region and for the greater good of Afghans. Mm-hmm. And, and a um, lot of people have welcomed that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ambassador, talking of terrorism, and as you uh, talked about the UN report, there are also concerns um, within India about a larger, uh, you know, role that that Pakistan plays in this. And then um, there are these uh, reports coming up that probably now with the Ukraine war raging in, the focus from Afghanistan is diminishing, and that is what is giving um, terrorist groups like even ISIS K to make Afghanistan as the next hub. Uh, w- what are your readings on that? Oh, well, Ukraine has certainly taken over, um, and Afghanistan is uh, is um, is an urgent priority for the world. Um, we no longer remain, or Afghanistan no longer remains a priority for um, for the international, for the greater international community. Uh, Ukraine is uh, is going through a difficult and and, uh, and critical time, and we have all our sympathy with them. Um, the Ukrainians are, are suffering, and we feel and share their pain. We have been through a similar situation for almost forty three years now. Um, but Afghanistan should not be left alone. We also require international attention, international help, uh, which is not there at this stage. Um, the focus on Afghanistan has reduced to special representatives, um, special representatives of, of numerous Europeans and Western countries are handling Afghanistan's portfolio, uh, a nation of Almost 40 million people deserve greater involvement at a senior level than what we are seeing today. Secondly, a more coherent um, plan f- from the international community to help Afghans uh, to come to terms with the current stalemate. There is a stalemate in our country. And that stalemate would produce more crisis. We would lead to turmoil if it is not properly and timely addressed. Um, and, and this leads to the second point of your question. Mm-hmm. Afghanistan turning into a sanctuary for terrorist groups. There are already uh, alarms from many international organizations. UN in particular, the 13 analytical uh, security and monitoring report from the UN Security Council shows that terrorist activities have increased in Afghanistan. ISIS-K, their operatives in Afghanistan have doubled from 2,000 operatives to 4,000 in size from August last year to June this year. It has doubled. It has doubled in size. We have 20, 21 terrorist outlets in the country. So um, this is not that I, I claim um, you know, the international uh, organizations are there. The UN political entity, UNAMA, is present there on the ground. And this is not uh, the assessment of the Afghan embassy in Delhi. But look at what uh, the international community is coming up with. Um, we had in, an increasing number of attacks on, on places of worships, including mosques, kurdwaras, uh, um, uh, uh, other places where Sufism is, is practiced. Um, so looking at the indices and indicators of terror activities, there is a trajectory which shows that um, uh, that terror is on the rise in the country. Uh, and the Afghans, like I said earlier, um, the Afghans are fed up with more conflict. It is way too long. Um, People of my generation have seen nothing but conflict. Uh, We were born during conflict. 
and we raised uh, um, during we were raised during those years of conflict. So, and how much more uh, conflict would an ordinary Afghan go through? Um, you know, it's 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 also a fact to re to be remembered that we the Afghans have never been involved in any major terrorist activity. There was not a single Afghan in 9-11. Uh, no Afghan hijacked the planes and hit Twin Towers. There was no Afghans who was involved in, in the London bombing 7-7, Madrid bombing, Melbourne bombing, Taj Palace bombing in, in, in Mumbai, the attack on Parliament, Indian Parliament here. Palwama or any other major terror attack in the region uh, or internationally. Yet, Afghans pay the price for those atrocities. We are the victims for, for, for those um, atrocities. So, uh, we require help. We are helpless. Our people are made hostage by many of these terrorist outlets. Uh, and this is a request that our former leaders, uh, uh, President Karzai uh, and, and Dr. Abdullah, are consistently demanding Taliban to uh, to take appropriate and reasonable and responsible steps in order to avoid such atrocities from being repeated again. Uh, should we enter another conflict, it would take another 20 years. Um, you know, we would again be at that stage where we would have to sit with each other, uh, listen to one another and, and come to terms with uh, this senseless conflict. Then why not now? This is the time. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in India's engagement or the engagement of other regional actors or the international community is, is welcomed by the Afghans. Uh, and we hope that um, Taliban would give peace a chance. Mm -hmm. uh, Ambassador, my last question to you would be on the role that is being played by several ambassadors like yourself. Um, yes, there are certain Afghan embassies where the Taliban has come in, but uh, embassies like this in Delhi, uh, in India, how are you kind of operating? What are the difficulties that you are facing? You're having to talk to uh, Kabul also and also hope for a you know a day where things will be settled so what are the challenges that you are facing you're also having to face the refugee well, issue well it's personally it's, it's an, an honor to serve my country and my, and my people um, i have worked um, uh, in the afghan government for, for for many years i've served um, both president Karzai and president Ghani and um, uh, we are at a stage now that uh, there is no republic, no state. And, and being a stateless mission, um, uh, that makes you uh, a less valuable diplomatic mission. Um, but our responsibility doesn't end there. We, we need to deliver it to our people in whatever way and form possible. Uh, we have around 70 missions around the world and, and most of us keep in, in, in close coordination. Um, for us, for missions like us in Delhi, we have transformed our operations more into humanitarian and consular services. We estimate that there are over 100,000 Afghans living in, in India. You know, we have closer to 14,000 students, 30,000 plus refugees and a big Afghan Hindu and Sikh community. We have 13 Gurdwaras belonging to Afghans, Afghan Sikhs in, in Delhi alone. So there is a big community that requires consular services. Secondly, humanitarian assistance, where our coordination is critical with UN agencies, uh, whether it's wheat, the delivery of wheat, whether it is the delivery of medicine, we play our role in it. Uh, and third, we are the voice of our people. We have a platform. Uh, where we can raise issues of significance to our people. We have access to a networking system where we can highlight uh, uh, the challenges of our people and give those voiceless people a voice 
they require that support. Uh, so it is certainly a difficult time for us to operate without um, policy from Kabul, without financial assistance from Kabul, uh, without appropriate administration from Kabul. Uh, but this may be a testing time for us and maybe uh, um, a testing time once in a generation uh, to stand there and, and, uh, and make a point and fulfill both personal, professional and moral responsibilities. And those, all those demand some sacrifices. I thank my colleagues for, for, for choosing to continue uh, and, and stay in Delhi without much compensation. And not only in Delhi, but also in Mumbai and Hyderabad, who are doing an, an excellent job to continue serving the tricolor flag of, of, our, of our country. Uh, and prove the point uh, not only to the host nations but to the international community and to the Taliban that uh, there are people who are willing to work for a system given that that becomes inclusive, given the fact that that becomes uh, a system which would honor and respect human rights, women's rights. Uh, we, the Afghan state had invested heavily on, on systems over the years and on people like us. So it's time for us to return that back to the country. Um, and I think the presence of, of, um, of all those missions abroad and mm. their activism, or rather political activism at this stage, would put some pressure on Taliban, uh, mm. where they may feel that uh, there are Afghans out there who who disagree with the way we govern the country uh, and would have to contemplate on the fact that uh, things need to operate rather differently. Sure, thank you so much, Ambassador, for that. I wish you good luck and thank you again for talking to the print. Um, that was Afghan Ambassador to India, Ambassador Farid Mamunze. You are watching the Prince YouTube channel. This is Nainima Basu and with me on camera is Pooja Kher.